All right, with that, uh, again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. It's been great having you. We've had a really engaged audience all day long. We had thousands of people register for this event. And we're going to continue to do these types of events throughout the year. So hopefully you'll join us for more of those. With that, the final presentation of today's boot camp, Chris Vecchio with the basics of gold and oil market fundamentals. Chris, it's all you. Thanks so much, Todd. Uh, and thank you everyone so much for your attendance here today. I appreciate everyone coming out on this uh, Tuesday, May the 4th. As a Star Wars fan, I have to tell you, this is one of my favorite days of the year. But we're here today to talk about a, a pretty important topic. While you've heard a lot about some of the uh, plumbing of how trading works and even Brian's most recent presentation on the data that comes out that impacts these markets, we're gonna do a deeper dive back to the basics, back to the fundamental ground level information about oil and gold markets. Uh, because so much of the time when new traders approach these markets or any market in particular, they don't know the historical backdrop. They don't understand all the mechanics of why prices are moving for the reasons that they are. Brian briefly touched on some of those reasons, but even within the economic data themselves, there are other forces at play. And those are the market fundamentals that we're gonna discuss here and now. So I do appreciate your time here for the next 40 minutes or so over the course of this presentation. Before we get started, of course, I do want to remind everyone that there are a few risk disclaimers and disclosures I need to leave across the screen for just a few seconds of your time. And as always, please be aware that any opinion I disseminate, of course, is mine and mine alone, does not constitute uh, trade advice on behalf of Daily FX or IG Group, so please do not treat it as such. Uh, with that said, I'm very much looking forward to this presentation here. And we're basically going to break down this presentation today into three different segments. We're going to go to Econ 101, you know, kind of back to our university classroom and talk about supply and demand. We're also going to then touch specifically on what the core fundamentals of oil are and what the core fundamentals uh, for gold uh, are in our immediate purview as traders both short-term and perhaps as longer-term traders, which we just simply call investors. Uh, but back to Econ 101, uh, supply and demand. Um, you know, when you open up your intro to economics textbook, one of the first discussions you'll encounter is about supply and demand uh, and elasticity. And supply and demand are simple enough concepts on the surface. So we'll start there before we uh, dive into the specifics of gold and oil themselves. Now, market participants are short-term or long-term. You know, they are traders or they are investors, but they can also be outside observers like economists, people who study supply and demand to determine how changes in production impact prices. And in effect, there are going to be two sides determining price. Demand and supply breaks down into buyers and sellers. And like I said, we're going to go real simple here. When I said simple, because we want to distill these terms into something that we can understand and utilize as we interpret information. For the macro realm itself, it feels like so much of this information is, uh, for lack of a better phrase, it's Hebrew when we need to be speaking Yiddish, right? So we're going to try to distill this down to the simple supply demand level here. Now, price will simultaneously reflect the value to buyers and the cost to sellers at any given point in time. The demand is reflecting the ability and willingness of buyers to purchase a given quantity of a good or service, while supply reflects the ability and willingness for sellers to offer a given quantity of a good or service. And for different levels of prices and goods and services, both supply and demand will differ. And these relationships ultimately yield uh, what we call supply and demand curves. Now, as demand rises, the law of supply dictates that sellers will offer more of their goods and services to the market in order to capture extra surplus the additional demand creates. Over time, as sellers push up prices, the law of demand tells us that buyers will want less of that good or service. In response, sellers may eventually lower prices. This constant push and pull is a market's eternal search for the equilibrium price for said good or service. And when a market is in equilibrium, it is said that buyers have reached the maximum price 
they're willing to pay for a good or service at the lowest level sellers are willing to accept for said good or service. And that, my friends, is the basic concept of supply and demand when it comes to any market in the world. But within oil and gold, there are actually specific nuances that we need to keep an eye on because gold market demand and supply is structured a little bit differently than just a simple one buyer for one seller. Like any other traded good or service, oil markets are governed by laws of supply and demand. And as supply increases, price tends to drop. And as supply decreases, prices tend to rise. On the other hand, as demand increases, prices tend to increase. And demand inc decreases, prices tend to fall. OK. But in the oil market, demand is different. Why? Demand is more stable than supply, as demand is represented by hundreds of millions of participants, individual consumers, businesses, governments, while supply is represented by only a handful of meaningful producers, mainly OPEC, Canada, Russia, and now the United States. Now, while they can be broken down, oil markets can be broken down into a binary supply and demand relationship, Oil markets aren't normal as theory would ascribe. You know, we talk about the the demand coming from all these sources, from consumers, and the byproducts of oil are used in almost everything that people use every day. You know, in fact, if you're wearing uh, some workout clothing right now, there's petroleum byproduct in your Under Armour or Nike clothing. We're, we're talking about fuel for cars, fuel for heating, electricity generation, plastics, oils everywhere. Demand is fluent through society but supply isn't as deep there's only a handful of significant sellers relative to the hundreds of millions of buyers each given day the concentration held by opec the organization of petroleum exporting countries accounts for 34 percent of global oil supply and operating as a cartel opec has really one main goal to coordinate production efforts in order to keep oil prices elevated to the benefit of their members other major oil producers historically include Canada, Russia, as mentioned, but with the emergence of shale in the United States, we've seen that the U.S. has become prominent too. Well, there are a few other things <clears throat> at play here, and, and one uh, you know, point I'd like to bring up, questions I've gotten a lot recently, is what do you think about you know, some of the stimulus plans, some of the uh, uh, efforts to electrify the grid? What will this do for oil prices? I think somewhat conversely, it actually means that there's an incentive to keep oil prices higher. Right? If you're trying to incentivize people to shift to greener, quote unquote, energy forms, should I say, uh, uh, non-fossil fuel energy forms, you're going to want the spread between renewables and these legacy fossil fuels to be as wide as possible. When oil is at $20 a barrel, there's no incentive for the consumer to switch to uh, you know, a high startup cost of installing a generator or a solar panels in their home. But when oil is at $100 a barrel, all of a sudden that upfront cost doesn't really matter because that money would be spent over the course of the year on traditional energy sources anyway. And so we're beginning to see a lot of different structural changes, not just in the supply of the market, but how governments uh, shift incentives for consumers. I'm of the belief that because of these shifting incentives, we actually have a natural tailwind behind oil prices in this ESG world. I mentioned before in the supply and demand discussion, there's this concept of elasticity. Elasticity is the concept that how sensitive is a given item relative to a shift in prices, right? If something is really uh, uh, elastic, it's more sensitive to price changes. So if we're gonna say, you know, if, uh, uh, what's a good example here? Gas prices, of course. If gas prices go up, say 10% for every 1% move in oil, we would say that's extremely elastic. If we were to say that gas prices only went up, say half a percent for 1% move in oil prices, we would say that they're inelastic. Oil is actually one of the most elastic tradable commodities out there. It is extremely responsive to changes in supply and demand. You know, we're going to talk about this real quick, briefly, and then I have a great real-world example to bring to you, which happened within the last, say, 
13 months or so. But if oil is truly an elastic good, it's going to be sensitive. And if demand is stable, given the hundreds of millions of consumers out there every single day, then what moves oil markets in particular is not necessarily perceived changes in demand, but it's more about perceived changes in supply. And we've had in recent years this concept of oil being in a supply glut, where there's been too much oil out there. And now in the coronavirus pandemic recovery era, OPEC plus among other countries that are large oil producers are actually constraining their output to avoid flooding the market with additional inventory. Now, part of this, a lot of this, may be due to what be considered technological development here in the United States. But the other side of this is that we are now seeing a situation where, in the US at least, the shifts in preferences among consumers is starting to drive demand changes at enough of a level where unintended consequences are spilling into the market. Um, what do I mean about a real world example? Well, recall what happened in April 2020. This only happened in crude oil markets, not in Brent. And it only happened in crude oil because crude oil is only stored in the United States, really. Uh, Brent oil has hubs all over the world. But with the coronavirus pandemic coming the way that it did, we had a sudden stop in oil consumption. Businesses, consumers, uh, industrial processes alike had much lower demand for oil and its uh, byproducts. And so there was just too much out there. There was nowhere to put oil that was being pumped out of the ground. And so briefly, in April 2020, oil prices in the United States futures went negative. And it went negative because we reached our supply limit. We could pump oil and there was nowhere to put it. So if you wanted someone to take your oil, you actually had to pay them to hold on to it. Now, for many companies, this was disastrous because they have to continue to keep pumping because they have to meet debt obligations. And so when oil goes that low and it goes negative, it creates other economic hardships. It's one of the reasons, in fact, why there's some concern that U.S. oil production may not return to its pre-pandemic levels until 2022 or 2023. So as OPEC here is now at the helm of the global regime of oil supply alongside perhaps Russia, we call this group OPEC plus to an extent, uh, we are very much at the whims of some of the economic data that Brian was just mentioning to us. Some of these weekly, weekly inventory reports uh, from EIA, for example, or, or the Department of Energy, they are really informative. They're really important uh, for the economy and particularly for traders right now who are trying to navigate not just, say, oil trading, but even other asset classes. And I say that because oil has a strong relationship to a lot of other asset classes. Generally speaking, oil prices tend to remain positively correlated with assets that track growth. And the first asset that comes to mind is equities. You know, as a rule of thumb, if we see that the economy is growing rapidly, where there will be greater demand for oil, we'll probably see that we're going to be in a world where demand is outstripping supply in general. And that means future cash flows will increase in value which increases the value of equities today. And on the other hand, when the global economy is slowing, we tend to see oil slump and demand fade and equity values fall, reflecting pessimism over future corporate earnings. So investors, not just in commodity trading, but also in equity trading, in, in short-term equities trading, in FX markets, they're watching oil because it reflects a bigger macro picture for which they are also participating in. You know, to an extent that we say some currencies track oil, one comes to mind more than others, the Canadian dollar. Uh, while many currencies are seemingly not impacted by oil prices, there are several that are. The two major ones are the Canadian dollar and Russian ruble. Oil constitutes a significant portion of Canadian and Russian exports, and so it's not a surprise that these currencies track the value of oil. It's akin to how when silver prices do well, the Mexican peso does well, or when copper prices do well, the Chilean peso does well. Furthermore, to this point, when we think about the Canadian relationship with oil itself, 11% of Canadian GDP comes directly from activity related to oil. And when you think about US demand for oil, 
70% of Canadian exports go to the United States and 20% of Canadian GDP is directly derived from economic activity with the United States. And so when the price of oil goes up, that's good for Canadian producers, which means that Americans need to convert more of their dollars into Canadian dollars when they want to buy that oil. And so it makes sense fundamentally when you think about it, why the Canadian dollar would track something like oil. There's an actual economic underpinning there. And then that also speaks to the rationale for why we need derivatives markets and forwards so that these companies can hedge against changes in exchange rates so that they know that they can be able to satisfy demand in the future, even if there is exchange rate volatility. And what happens when hedgers come in and shift their positioning for these economic rationale? Well, they create positioning imbalances that allow for, say, short-term speculators to catch changes in trends and take advantage of mispricings in markets. You see, everything flows downhill to us as retail traders from the big macroeconomic picture at the end of the day. We are at the bottom of the mountain where the river is. The macro picture is the mountain at the top, the glacier, that's slowly melting, trickling all this information to us, giving us the opportunity that we need to grow and succeed in traders. In life, generally speaking. Now, there's something else here because oil prices, they're not just you know a market instrument. They have real world impacts as discussed. And so policymakers around the world, particularly those in central banks, they care very much about oil price swings. Uh, and, and they really care a lot when oil prices rally too quickly. The laws of supply and demand do come into play here. An exogenous shock, like a sharp increase in oil prices can have dramatic effects for the broader economy. You know, you think about the 1970s oil crisis in the United States, it's a bit before my time, but from what I've heard, there were long gas lines in the 70s and people would have to go every other day and wait and wait and wait. That was a supply shock. Now, when oil prices rise unexpectedly, inflation increases. And when inflation increases too rapidly, it tends to crimp consumption. Not only do policymakers respond typically with raising interest rates, that can dampen growth as credit becomes less freely available. The crimp on consumption causes aggregate demand to fall as well. And when aggregate demand in an economy falls, growth just isn't as strong, which has negative implications for employment. On the flip side, oil prices that fall rapidly can lead inflation to fall, which may allow central banks to keep policy looser for longer, Looser monetary policy in the U.S. in recent years can actually be pointed to as the rationale for why we saw the technological advancements occur in oil prices and oil technology altogether. Uh, without the ability for those companies to take out debt, to finance their R&D, to take the risk to open up that new well, would we have been able to see the shale industry grow with which the way that it did? I would suggest perhaps not. Low interest rates allow technology to continue to push forward as a leader because you need to find growth somewhere. And if it's not today, it's going to be in the future. Now, we've talked a whole bunch about oil here for the first uh, 20 minutes or so of this presentation. And of course, this is about gold and oil. So we're going to turn the page here. And if you do have any other comments or questions on oil trading, I would love to answer them. Uh, feel free to get in touch with me at any time. Chad, uh, Todd and I will chat after this and we'll exchange information in the chat box. But we're going to move on to gold now. Now, gold is a really fascinating asset, particularly in these days when we have a central bank like the Fed pumping untold amount of liquidity into the market. In fact, some charts that I was looking at this morning showed that at the end of 2019, central banks around the world we're talking about the Fed, the ECB, the BOE, the PBOC, and the BOJ. Uh, combined among them had roughly seen their uh, total balance sheet base go up by nearly 50% from the start of or end of 2019 to today. That's really incredible. And that's really incredible because that changes people's perception of value when there's that much liquidity sloshing around in the system. Now, why hasn't gold been able to take advantage of that, however? It initially rallied last year, 
since August, it's been struggling and it really hasn't been on an upward slope. In fact, there's an argument to be made that gold hasn't been doing well whatsoever. We're going to explain why that may be the case here, but we're going to need to go back to the very beginning. When I said that we're doing a deep dive, we're going to go back to the beginning. I mean, since time immemorial, human beings have had a special place in their heart for gold. Gold mines have been found dating back to ancient Egyptian and Nubian times. And it's believed that the first coinage of gold began sometime around 600 BC in what's now considered present day Turkey. Uh, the search and seizure of gold has been used as a pretext for war for hundreds of years, including the European nation's conquest of the Americas. Later in the 19th century, several European nations began using gold standards to shore up their finances. In the 20th and 21st centuries, gold was featured in a wide range of roles, from the top prize at the Olympics to the basis by which the Bretton Woods monetary system was founded upon. Even after the collapse of Bretton Woods in 1971, gold has been and I think will remain an interest of speculative investment, store of value, and perhaps hedge against inflation as it has been since the start of history. But is it the same as any other commodity? Is it like any other metal? Is it like oil? Well, it's a commodity, but it's different. I mean, we know it's not a stock, it's not a bond, it's not a currency or derivative, okay. And so it falls under the asset umbrella of alternative investments. Investors typically look to commodities like gold for their diversification poten uh, potential, excuse me. Historically speaking, correlations with gold and other asset classes uh, are low, they tend to be low. When you look at gold versus stocks, gold versus bonds, generally they're not that strong. And like other commodities, supply and demand play a role here. But unlike other commodities, particularly precious metals like silver, which has uses for electrical appliances, super semiconductor batteries, uh, platinum, automobile production inputs, gold has few of any industrial uses on a wide spread scale. And as such, rather than consumption playing the primary driver for gold prices, the demand side is driven by the relationship, what's known as savings and disposal. When we mean savings and disposal, we mean reasons like as a hedge against inflation, a safe haven during times of market duress and geopolitical stress, or as perhaps even an alternative to fiat currencies during periods of low or negative interest rates. Uh, and I say interest rates here. Interest rates are the most dominant factor. When we talk about interest rates, we want to think about not just your U.S. Treasury 10-year yield. We're thinking about your real yield. How do we find our real yield? We could be talking about our inflation-adjusted yield, the Treasury 10-year yield minus the core inflation rate, it uh, could be from a market measure like the 10 year break even rate. The point is that we're looking for inflation adjusted returns. What's our return after adjusting for, compensating for, accounting for price growth? Because if I get a raise wage of 10%, but my rent goes up by 10%, I don't really feel like my real wage has gone any higher, right? That's the situation that we're talking about here. Because at the end of the day, investing is all about asset allocation and risk-adjusted returns. It's about achieving required returns given the given investor or trader's wants and needs. If inflation expectations are rapidly increasing, you would expect to see something with, say, a fixed income underperform, right? The returns are fixed after all. Why would you want to have a fixed return when prices are increasing? On a real basis, your returns would be lower than otherwise intended. So for example, let's say the US Treasury 10-year yield is currently 2.5 and core inflation is 2%. That means that the nominal interest rate is 2.5 and our real interest rate is 0.5%. Let's say you still held on to those US Treasury yields and inflation shot up to 4.5%. Your real interest rate would be negative 2. 4.5 less 2.5. And that's a problem as an investor. You can't afford negative rates of return. You're in the market, after all, to grow your asset base. And so that paints an important picture. That means that 
gold really is not that appealing of an asset if we're seeing real rates go up. Real rates go up when nominal yields increase faster than inflation expectations. Real yields drop or go negative when inflation expectations increase faster than nominal yields, or in this case, U.S. Treasury yields. Why do we like the falling real yields? Falling real yields means that the spread between U.S. Treasury yields and inflation rates are decreasing. If gold yields nothing, and according to several studies, has an estimated cost of carry around 2.4% negative, it means that gold really can only return capital appreciation for you, right? It doesn't have a coupon. It doesn't have a dividend. There's no cash flow associated with it. Gold's really only going to be suited to rally when U.S. yields fall. And that means gold's appeal as an inflation hedge relative to the U.S. dollar increases, not in an environment when inflation is just rising, but when inflation is rising and nominal interest rates are not rising at the same pace. Unlike traditional asset classes, which have cash flows, golds don't. Gold, silver, platinum, palladium, any of these precious metals, they're not going to give you anything in return. There may be a demand argument to be made for some of the other metals because of the industrial uses. But gold itself, unfortunately, it relies on capital appreciation and that dynamic around yields altogether. And that's why when you see anything that I write about gold, you'll see me frequently reference volatility and what's happening in the U.S. Treasury market. Because if U.S. yields are going up, well, then let's take a look at the inflation picture. And if inflation expectations are going up faster than U.S. yields are going up, then maybe gold isn't such a bad option after all. It all depends on what the macro mix tells us. Now, the macro mix for gold, however, it's changed a lot over the years. In fact, the way that we talk about gold trading today is quite removed from what we used to do in years past. I say that you know when interest rates go down, gold appeal goes up. That wasn't always the case. You know, we go back to 1971. It was August 1971, and France, among other European countries, were selling off their U.S. dollar reserves. Uh, they were trying to repatriate some local currency. They had a huge boom in economic growth in the post-World War II era, financed by the Marshall Plan, and quite frankly, was putting a ton of stress onto the U.S. dollar. And the United States was hit on the other side, too, because we had the Vietnam War. The United States just simply couldn't handle it. The fiscal system was beginning to strain and stress. And so on August 15th, 1971, Richard Nixon announced that we would be leaving Bretton Woods and with it suspending direct convertibility of the dollar to gold. Uh, that was huge. It was a big deal. Now, this was a plan to allow the dollar to settle out a new exchange rate against other major currencies in what was at the time called, and I say this with a laugh in my voice, quote, a one-time devaluation, unquote. <clears throat> there was an issue. The official devaluation actually never happened. Policymakers never followed through with it. Instead, the U.S. dollar entered a free float era of foreign exchange rates. And so once the Bretton Woods monetary system swept away, the era of gold trading being driven by interest rates began. And so too really did FX trading. Central banks have an interest in gold. They've been weighing it on gold. They've been buying it and selling it. They've been adding it to their balance sheets. Country sovereigns have been doing this too. But we need to consider gold's role in this central bank picture here. You know, it's important to recall some macroeconomic theory. When central banks want to control interest rates, they can expand or contract the money supply as they see fit. And by expanding the money supply, interest rates are typically driven down, making the cost of capital cheaper. On the other hand, by shrinking the money supply, interest rates are driven up, making the cost of capital more expensive. In theory, during times in which central banks are expanding the money supply, their money supplies, uh, uh, or rather, it, during times in which central banks are expanding their money supplies and driving interest rates down, gold's appeal should theoretically go up. Does this sound familiar? This theory was tested 
in real time recently during the global financial crisis when central banks around the world, led by the Federal Reserve, embarked on their QE programs. Oh yeah, and it's happened just again when central banks around the world embarked on their QE programs to pull global economies away from the brink thanks to the global coronavirus pandemic. We've seen this play before, so to speak, right? We've seen this environment historically play out. It was just a decade ago. We had central banks come in, they lowered rates, they flooded the zone with liquidity. Why do they do this? Well, in times of credit crisis, and this is a really important point to understand to get at the heart of why central banks are doing what they're doing and why I think the narrative of, well, central banks are going to lose control and equity markets are going to crash and gold's going to go to the moon, why that I think is a little jaded and perhaps conspiratorial. Because in a system when the money supply is constrained, when liquidity is constrained, companies that are illiquid get confused by the market for those that are insolvent. And that's a huge difference for a corporation or a business. If I'm illiquid, and in fact, I have a great example. I'm illiquid right now. I have zero dollars cash in my wallet, but I'm not insolvent. I could go to the ATM and pull money out of the bank, right? That's basically what happens when there's no credit in the system. If there's a run on my bank, it doesn't matter that I have money in the bank. I'm both now illiquid and insolvent. So by keeping the banking system afloat, by flooding the zone with liquidity, the economy is basically able to extend a lifeline to those companies that were being swept away in the tides of illiquidity. When they were solvent, they just didn't have access to short-term funding markets to meet their liquidity needs. And so what did central banks do again just now? We saw them flood the zone with liquidity in the global coronavirus pandemic response. We've seen the balance sheet of the major central banks go up by basically 50% in the past year plus now, since the start of the pandemic. It's been a seismic shift. And the point here is to prevent unintended consequences, otherwise healthy companies, otherwise healthy institutions from failing that were deprived of access to certain aspects of the market from short-term funding. We've also seen fiscal authorities do this too, by say, extending the PPP program, preventing businesses from going under because they wouldn't be able to meet payroll or wouldn't be able to meet the cost of fulfilling their invoices to suppliers. What we have seen here in the United States, once again, is by flooding the market with liquidity, we've seen an environment of negative real yields emerge. Now, one of the problems for gold, I think, since August has been the fact that we're in a little bit of a different scenario than post-global financial crisis. Global financial crisis itself uh, was met with a persistent negative real yield environment. What we saw at the start of this year, and this was something that even was going on at the end of 2020, was that U.S. Treasury yields were increasing at a rate faster than U.S. inflation expectations. And so when you look at market measures of this, you would take the U.S. Treasury 10-year yield, subtract the U.S. 10-year break-even rate, and you would see that real interest rates were going up. And as we've established here, gold likes negative real yields. It likes falling real yields. And so when real yields are going up, yes, they're still negative, but when they're becoming less negative, that makes gold less appealing. What we're seeing happen now, however, is catching my eye. Because inflation expectations are starting to increase rapidly once more. And while U.S. Treasury yields are going up, they're certainly not matching the cadence at which inflation expectations are starting to rise. We can look to the corn market, we can look to the wheat market, we can look to copper, we can look to other commodities to get a hint at where inflation might be going. Because after all, someone's got to absorb the price increase. 
And so while this has been a challenging environment for gold right now, with central banks flooding the zone and seemingly it not fitting the narrative, I thought gold went up when central banks increased the money supply. How come it's not happening again? How come it's not happening since last August? I think the rationale is still clear. The real yield impulse hasn't been negative. It's maybe becoming negative once more now. That's not the only impulse for gold, though. Gold prices are impacted by politics. I had a coworker years ago. He used to say, gold is the ultimate hedge against incompetence on the sovereign level. From issues like lacking fiscal discipline to deterioration in diplomatic relations between countries, gold has proven to be one of the top choices that investors flee to when seeking safety for their capital. You know, that or Bitcoin, I guess. Uh, jokes aside, to no surprise, gold appeals a safe haven, you know, is connected to interest rates. When the average person thinks of safe haven in terms of investing, they probably think, I need to sell everything and go into cash. On a more sophisticated level, investors will head into cash or cash equivalents, cash equivalents being, you know, bonds like U.S. Treasuries. And since government bond prices and yields are inversely related, Greater demand for government bonds typically means that yields go down. When geopolitical tensions are rising, increased demand for bonds puts upward pressure on bond prices and downward pressure on nominal and thus real interest rates. In effect, the demand for gold during heightened geopolitical tensions is derivative. It's purely the result of lower nominal and real interest rates. So when we see something like I remember as a kid, it was March 2003. It was when the United States was going to war with Iraq and we saw the first drum, uh, bombs drop on Baghdad. I remember one of the uh, the macroeconomic class I was in, in eighth grade. Todd's not going to like that timeline. Uh, but back then, what we had seen was that U.S. Treasuries peaked at that time. Gold markets peaked around that time when you look at historical reviews. It's really interesting to see how the machinations of interest rates filter in through these historical events into gold markets in particular. I mentioned this term a moment ago, what's a safe haven? And I just want to briefly touch on it. Safe havens are investments or asset allocations that are expected to retain or increase in value during times of heightened market volatility. Safe havens are designed or desired as a way to limit losses across a portfolio of investments, given the expected lower or negative rates of return seen in traditional asset classes like bonds or stocks during market sell-offs. When risk appetite is running high, on the other hand, safe havens lose appeal as they don't offer high enough rates of return to justify staying invested. And believe it or not, gold is that safe haven. It has a positive relationship historically with volatility. During times of extreme market duress, you'll see that gold and gold volatility have a hand-in-hand -hand relationship positive on, on a 5 EMA, on a 20 EMA, on a 50 EMA basis. It's really fascinating to see this play out in real time. We saw it actually last year during the global coronavirus pandemic. You can look on your charts, compare GVZ, the gold volatility ETF, to say GC. One, which is uh, the gold futures chain that GVZ is uh, based upon. So just thinking about the nature of gold trading, it's more about sentiment and theme out there. What's happening on the macro level? With oil, it's more about what's happening with supply and demand. These are both commodities, but they have fundamentally different approaches for how you need to analyze them and understand them. They have different histories as well. In fact, if you notice, I didn't really touch on oil's history because a lot of what happened historically in oil doesn't really line up with what's happening in the market today, thanks to changes in how supply is constructed and the way demand is built on the global economy. And on the other hand, gold itself seems to be completely removed from some of the typical supply and demand issues unto themselves, focusing more on this idea of savings and disposal. These are deep dive issues that we talk about for oil and gold. This is the seafloor level foundation of oil and gold trading. 
But with this information, you may have better context to understand why certain news comes across your Twitter account or your trading platform or CNBC or Bloomberg or whatever your information portal is for understanding economic information and corporate news flow during the course of the day. This perhaps helps provide that context and will provide you the edge that you need to think maybe what happened next in the market. And speaking of what's happening next in the market, that's basically what we're here for at Daily Effects. Our job here is to provide the context and clarity for what's going on to help you as a trader become a better decision maker. At the end of the day, we want you to be a trader with Nadex, with IG, a client of Daily Effects for as long as possible because that means you're doing well. So we're here to help you. We do this in a number of ways. We highlight articles with fundamental and technical items, along with the implications for markets. We produce live webinars. We share forecasts weekly, as well as quarterly guides for different asset classes. You'll find us across a variety of social channels, including Twitter and YouTube. And we support IG and Nadex, I should mention, with research and education at events like these. So I more uh, than willing to show up again in the future, Todd, as you've been so gracious for inviting me to these events. And I hope to continue to appear here because when we navigate these shifting market conditions from a high volatility environment, like what we saw in say January at the start of this year to where we are now when volatility is falling, we may not be privy to the changing tides. And for many of us who have been through these conditions, we want to help you make those right decisions to find what the best path is for you as you seek your financial freedom. And at the end of the day, we're here to give you those tools. So I thank you for your time and attention. I hope that this was of some interest, of some utility. If not, let me know. Of course, love the feedback. If you do have any comments or questions, you can always reach out to me through my Twitter feed at CVeccioFX, C-V-E-C-C-H-I-O-F-X, or you can find me on dailyfx.com.